Uh, Glenn's not going to introduce me, so I'll introduce myself. Um, <laughs> this, uh, talking about early contractor involvement and project incentivisation. In fact, I'm going to probably reverse the order in which I'm going to talk about it. Um, just very briefly about me. Um, I did my PhD in, on the NEC, finished in 1998. I then did two years part-time industry-funded research into collaborative procurement routes for partnering, because at the time, partnering was, let's select the person on the lowest cost under traditional contracts, have a workshop, hug a tree, do a red-blue game, and we'll be fine, yeah? And we thought there's got to be something, and we, when I say we, um, my ex-professor John Perry, who uh, co-instigated the NEC, thought there had to be a bit more to it than this, so we thought it uh, relates to commercial alignment, basically, so getting everybody pointing in the same direction. So, in terms of what I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm just going to turn my stopwatch on, just to... I don't have Glenn reminding me. Um, we're going to talk about why negative incentives mostly don't work, why positive incentives are perhaps more likely to work in terms of a, uh, a client getting what they want and a contractor for that matter. Different methods of early contractor involvement, so there's four different methods. Uh, and then very briefly, because I suspect time will be tight, three, the three basic types of alliance, uh, on, on what an alliance is, and then some conclusions or reflections so, uh, why negative incentives mostly don't work? So, uh, does this ring true? Projects delivered under contract, projects happen over a period of time, they're subject to risk and external factors, they have quite a lot of independencies between the two parties to the contract. Does, does that strike true to people? Yeah? Okay. And therefore, it's quite common for both parties, as well as other third parties, to not do exactly what they committed to under the contract. Now, whether that's the conditions of contract and replying within a set time or supplying something or giving access or whatever it is, it stands to reason that in a long-term relationship or over a period of time with a project, someone's going to muck up somewhere, yeah? Something's going to change. And in fact, and some contractors might be surprised by this, clients sometimes change their mind. <laughs> Who'd have thought? Um, and given that, when a provider, and I'm using the terminology in the APM contracts and procurement guide here, uh, a provider becomes late, uh, even though they might be partly or almost wholly responsible, they naturally try and shift, shift some blame onto the other party, the client. So, well, you didn't do that, and suddenly that's the cause of it. And why? Because they're trying to get out of the financial liability for it the damages, the over under, whatever it is. Um, and if you're doing that behaviour, so, so then you're actually focusing on uh, not solving the problem, but transferring liability. And you get into the fight or flight response. And guess what happens? The other party gets into the fight or flight response. And away you go and things deteriorate. Now, it's not just the contractor who does that. Sometimes clients muck up. And then they go, oh, yeah, but the contractor did this. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll start pushing, saying, oh, it's because of you, all the delay, et cetera, or whatever. Okay? So the focus goes on uh, transferring liability rather than solving the actual problem. And that's the problem with damages, yeah? So why positive uh, incentives, perhaps not mostly do work, are more likely to work, et cetera, in terms of what getting a successful project? So, do you recognise these first two bullet points? Yeah, exactly the same scenario. So, what happens is, if the provider only gets a positive incentive for achieving a set target, and that positive incentive, the base from which that's evaluated, is not going to change. So, we have delays, but unlike damages to get out of damages, contracts have mechanisms to put it back so that they're still operable, those mechanisms. If you say that point is fixed in time, for instance, except for exceptional reasons, then actually, when that a problem occurs, people can't go, well, it was your compensation, and no, it wasn't, it was this much, etc. Or well, they can. But actually, we both want the incentive. The client wants the incentive to be paid, believe it or not, because that means they're getting what they want. And the contractor wants an incentive to be paid for obvious reasons. Um, and likewise for the client. Now, obviously, a client isn't going to specify, or a fool, only a foolish client would specify, an incentive 
and a payment which is mo worth more than the benefit they get. Yeah? And sometimes that's the barrier to it. The, uh, the, uh, it costs more for the contractor to deliver it than the benefit that would be received, potentially. So, people on the same page about why incentives are more, uh, more likely to work, because most often when you go through this, you can see some positive incentives, some, some nods to people say, oh yeah, I've experienced that. Yeah, okay. Um, some other, just to some other points, uh, legally, if I can show you that you inhibited my performance in some way or other, uh, and it's a breach of contract in some way or a compensation event, uh, then there has to be a mechanism to put it back. Um, so, but the same level of performance can actually be phrased as a bonus, if you're clever about it, okay? Um, so there was a, when I did my research, there was a quote from, I think it was a Bechtel project manager, um, who said, uh, we often, the, the, the amount we pay is exactly the same for the same level of performance. We've just structured the contract so it's a bonus. But it seems to make a huge amount of difference in terms of how people behave and tackle issues. Okay? So it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to be paying out more. It just might be how you structure the words of the contract. But providers, again, use, uh, contractors, consultants, etc., often like damages of some form to be stated because it caps their liability. Otherwise, they can be at large and they don't know what their liabilities are. So contractors can refuse, consultants can refuse unless there's caps. That could be a cap per day on damages, delay damages. It could be an overall cap on liability. So my research conclusion all those years ago was actually probably a combination, and this was based on, there's a lot of research from America as well, but. Um, where, which basically said positive incentives are far more beneficial than negative incentives, and that was a really wide research. But my conclusion was you probably want a combination of positive incentives and negative incentives, but to get the positive behaviour, and therefore the positive results, you want the focus to be on the, po the, the positive incentives. Now, I will pay you extra for achieving a, su uh, a, a superior level of performance. Before we get into the ECI bits, uh, principles of risk allocation and sharing. So it's come out as orange on there. It's red on when I did it originally. But why do you think risk is orange and green? <laughs> Pardon? Yeah, yeah, threat and opportunity. Yeah, so risk can be threat and opportunity. So it's principles of allocating threat and opportunities. And underline sharing. Yeah, because people share risk, yeah. Um, in fact, uh, when Martin Barnes, who co-instigated the NEC, he published the first paper on principles of risk allocation before he did the NEC, um, but uh, then it was principles of allocation. People didn't really share things because the target cost contracts, etc., weren't, weren't widely used. But we do share things. You could say a weather risk or a physical condition risk is shared because up to a point, it's on the contractor, and above that point... The client shares it, but it's also sharing in terms of pain gain mechanisms under target cost contracts. And I've done it in shorthand because I have got the really full, precise wording somewhere, but um, I won't go through it line by line. So these are uh, the, the principles. So uh, often in the construction press, you read risk should be allocated to the party who can best manage it. Yeah. And there's some sense in there. But the first principle is who can best bear it, or the effect on the organisation's business. So, let's do that to your personal lives. How many of you have a house or a flat which you own? Hands up. Okay. How many of you have insurance on your house or flat? All of you. More, more of you seem to have insurance than have houses <laughs> or flats. <laughs> um, I've been our building oh, right there, Sarah, with her insurance background. <laughs> okay, there. Um, well, if who can best manage whether the, your house or flat burns down? You or the insurance company? <laughs> no? Who can best manage whether it's burgled? You or the insurance company? No? Some wag said the burglar, but anyway. Um, uh, but the principle is there. The reason for them is that for an insurance company, it's a statistic. For you, it's your life going up in flames or whatever. So you've, you've, you've transferred that risk to the party who can best bear it, the effect on their organisation. We are talking about risk, uh, opportunity and threat. So what's the effect, the positive effect on their bottom line as well? 
So if we translate that down to a construction con context, contract, if you're a contractor with a hundred million pound-ish turnover making 2% profit, but you've got a client who's got, say, two and a half billion pounds of income coming in per year, who's best able to bear risk? Yeah. And we're not talking, the comparison really shouldn't be between the 100 million pound necessarily and the 2.5 billion. It should possibly be between the 2 million pound profit and the 2.5 billion. Yeah, because that's what the contractors in business to do, generate the profit. And you've got to look at their books, etc., and so on. So then we say, okay, we look at that, and these are principles, so they might conflict. Who can best manage it, etc.? So having got the theory out of the way, oh yeah, attitude to risk. So you can say all the theory, you can look at the books and everything like that, um, and then you've got attitude. So um, who's the strongest client in the UK? Government, yeah. So they should take the majority of the risk. It's the average civil servant, uh, an entrepreneurial gung-ho. <laughs> No. So despite all the theory, there's attitude to risk and there's budgets and so on. So you have to consider that. That wasn't in my original research. I was probably still a bit naive then. OK, so let's go into uh, to how you can use this. So we've got a cost reimbursable contract here. So during the contract, I'm incurring defined cost. And on top of that, I get my fee percentage. And it's only one fee percentage in NEC4. So how much do I get paid as a contractor or have to pay out at any point in time? Well, my defined cost plus my fee percentage to give my amount due. Yep. How can I incentivize? So when might I use a cost reimbursable contract on a time-driven project? Now, I could, I could uh, incentivize them um, with uh, early completion. But there could be other things which I want to incentivize them on because it could be a live facility. So I don't want uh, the, the live facility to be closed down or users to have a happy experience, etc. So I could do it, use fee at risk with X12 or X20. And really with an X12, which is the multi-party collaboration one, we're looking at the KPIs, which are mirrored, if you like, in the X20 clauses. So there I could say, OK, what I want you to do is if you uh, achieve these other things which are important to me, then actually I'll increase your fee, at your fee, and therefore you'll get more profit. But often, the opposite of that is, well actually, we're going to have a starting point where your fee is lower. So you will get a very minimal or no fee if you do a rubbish job on all the other things. If you do an okay job, you'll get your normal fee, and if you do a better than I, uh, job than I expected, anticipated, etc., but which I wanted, I'm not just going to incentivize you for things I don't want, then I will pay you more, yeah? So, we could then go on to target cost contracts. So, here we've got the defined cost plus fee line. We've uh, negotiated, competitively bid, built up on an open book basis the target prices, and we have a 50-50 pay and gain share. So, this bisects it there. So how much does the, contra the contractor get paid? Well, they get paid, paid their defined cost plus fee, plus their share of savings at the end of the contract. And I can fade that out, and if I press this again, oops, there we go, contractor share and client share. Okay, up there, so we're on the NEC method t terminology now. So what could I do here? Well, what I could do, for instance, is I could say some of your fee or your share of savings is at risk if you don't perform to my other performance characteristics, yeah? Um, so if I take my, uh, one of my, uh, my probably my, my most prominent client, or my, the client which I do most work with, uh, Connect Plus, who maintain the M25 under a PFI, uh, we've basically said to the contractors, along with some other stuff, you are, a, it's a 30-70 split, if you like, 15% of your gain is guaranteed. You will definitely get that if you save money. But 15%, uh, you have to um, perform to these hygiene factors. So do you know what hygiene factors are? It's a management word for things that if you don't do, we'll get pissed off about. Yeah, that's my words, not Connect Pluses. Okay? Um, so things like, if you don't get a health and safety file in, yeah. If you get the health and safety file within, foot within, within the times of the contract and you do it on every single package in that contract, you will get 10 out of 10. And if you do the similar things across the board, 
you'll get your full fifth, another 15%, the full share of the savings. If you did it absolutely rubbish, you get zero, and obviously somewhere in between. So that's what we could do there. Um, and obviously, we can do it on the upside, as in, we'd, rather than just going, oh no, we're in pain, right, let's ignore all your other factors. If you carry on doing those things, the things which are important to us, actually you can reduce your pain as well. All right. uh, so go on to the curly contractor involvement, stage one. We have, so this is under one ECC option C contract with X22, which is the early contractor involvement clauses. So stage one is done on a cost plus basis. Uh, and because it's a cost reimbursable contract, that allows for physical work. So that physical work could be site investigation, it could be enabling works, etc. So that when we sign the main, or not sign the main contract, when we go over to a target cost arrangement, the stuff which has had to be done has been done, we're sort of on time. Okay? So there's a break, or you agree the target price. And then stage two is on a target cost basis and normally for detailed design and construction. Okay? But you've worked that up. They've got ownership of the design, the concepts, and worked it down. So you should get a quite a nice lean target. But having said that, if you take out all the risk and opportunity, why do a target cost contract? Yeah? Because you might as well go design and build the traditional preferred contractor approach. So there's a balance between when you enter the contract and when not to, the right sort of level of risk. And that's quite a hard subjective thing to, sort of, uh, to, to state. Uh, so you could do, alternatively, traditional early contractor involvement under one ECC option E contract with X22, but option E, the cost reimbursable contract. So stage one, you'll recognise the words, is done on a cost plus basis. Yeah. But then you enter into stage two, on a cost plus basis, but the gain is based around the savings on the overall project, not just under the target cost. So effectively that project budget yeah, is adjusted for far few reasons than target cost contracts and therefore will sit at a higher level than a target cost because it includes a lot of the risks which are normally compensation events. So what does that look like? Well, we have our project budget, and if I can, I don't know if this, if this works, if, does the, no, it doesn't work. Um, but if I, can you see that? No, it doesn't appear on there, okay. <laughs> but effectively, the target cost contract would be lower down than that at a lower level. So what happens here? Well, you've got the contractor's defined cost plus fee line, and then the client has some other co client costs, so that could be land take, it could be... Um, some consult consultant costs or whatever it is, and what you do is you say, okay, I'm going to incentivise you around that. And what under the amended ECC contract you have there is you have a share of the savings. There's no in there. And then actually, so that's the contractors and client share. But in the unamended form, there is no pain, gain, pain around the project budget. So you could argue that once you reach that level, the contractor's motivation disappears. So personally, I always think you should have some motivation. You might want to reduce the pain that they're suffering because of their financial ability, etc. But some pain, some, though you still want some skin in the game. Because a true collaboration isn't just about what happens when it's going well, it's also what happens when the proverbial hits the fan. Okay? So... Early contractor of involvement, another way, you could do it under two contracts. The first one is on one of the professional services contracts, and then rather than agree, to agree it and break, uh, or break, you effectively sign a new one. Okay? Now, my preference uh, is actually it's far easier to sign a new contract than get out of an existing one. And I see Sarah with her legal hat on uh, nodding along with that. Okay? Um, and then you sign a option C contract, for detailed design, and away you go, much the same. Okay. Um, oh, right. And the last one here is you've got a stage one gain on a professional services contract, best used when they're not doing physical work. Yeah. That could be that they're providing advice only, or it could be they're actually leading the design, although they'd probably be subcontracting it. 
And then what happens? Again, it's end or your new target cost contract, built up on an open book basis if it's single source, and then delivered on a uh, uh, option E, normally for detailed design and construction. Um, uh, but I'll make the point that as the, NE, uh, the NEC family is written, you would have to write in the pay and gain clauses around the project budget if um, you're using this contract strategy, because there isn't the cost reimbursable contract, if you like, uh, with, it presumes that there's a stage one under the cost reimbursable contract. So you could do those things. So I'm going to briefly cover um, alliances, but very briefly. So I've been talked around, you're looking as a client, the project budget versus the project cost. It's the same under project alliances. That's the concept. The difference in project alliances is it's not, it's, if you like, there's at least three people, parties involved. There's the client and a contractor and someone else. It could be a consultant, it could be another contractor. At least th three or more parties. So here we've got a consultant, contractors and suppliers. I know of alliances where there's been up to seven parties in it. If you've got too many, then it can get a bit diluted, which I'll come back to possibly if I have time. Um, the fundamental thing about an alliance, for me, for it to be a project alliance, is that objectives are aligned to the success of the overall project rather than individual contracts. Yeah? So if you looked at that and imagine each of those were target cost contracts with no alliance mechanism, each party would be motivated to save money on their contracts only and work with the employer. By having a, an incentive which ties the whole project together, people are work motivated to partner both vertically with the client and uh, <coughs> horizontally with each other. Um, okay? So that, now, there are basically three forms of it. The simple alliance is option X12, the multi-party collaboration under NEC3 is the partnering one. It's got various things, the core group, board of directors effectively for the project, partnering information, a bit more detail about he, how people are going to work together rather than just be nice to each other, um, you know, organisation, IT, etc. And you can specify KPIs with incentives against them. It is the, but the thing is, they are in, it's on the individual contracts, so there is no tying together contractually of the parties to that project. As a result, it is the easiest to put in place because if you're a contractor or a consultant, say I say, you've got exactly the same pay and gain, liabilities, etc., as if you had an individual contract, but I'm also going to pay you extra if the project overall is successful. Would you say no? There's no downside, yeah, to it, so you're going to say yes. You can also add people to it providing you've thought through the incentive mechanisms up front or have an idea, as you select people and add to it. You've then got what is sometimes called the pure alliance, or if you're a consultant uh, and you want to sell a, a, the latest uh, fad, the Australian alliance and whatever, but it's basically the NEC4 form of alliance. And this is where um, everybody signs the same contract at the same time. Now, that can be quite challenging, both legally and technically, because where everybody's got the same legal terms and it goes gone around the lawyers and someone wants to make a change and then it's got to go around the circle. And it also means all the technical information's got to be there at the same time, yeah? And if it doesn't work out and you decide to terminate, again, it's much harder to terminate a joint contract or terminate an individual from it than if it was in individual contracts. So you could, under the, uh, under the consultative version, certainly, you could get rid of an individual partner within it, but then you didn't have a contractor to deliver at all. You'd have to reselect the person or a party. So it's sort of, you back in, under EU procurement rules, you'd be back to square one and you'd have the time delay. The last one is the traditional alliance, and that's where you have, people have their normal contracts, whatever they are, often cost-based, um, but there is an overarching alliance agreement which ties the fortunes together. And that will be, so they all sign it, and it has both positive incentives, but also, if you like, what happens if it goes wrong. Yeah? One of the advantages, or a number of advantages of that, is one is you can have fit-for-purpose contractual relationships with each party. 
So on some allowances, people have people in a factory. Now you try and, if that's got lots of different production streams, you try and get to actual cost or defined cost in a factory, you can't do it, yeah? Or it's very, very hard to do it if they've got multiple projects being delivered in the same area. You can also get rid of one part party from the alliance but keep the same contract in place so they still have to deliver what's in their base contract but you haven't behaved or you're not being collaborative or whatever okay from there so uh, those are the three basic forms of alliance there's no NEC4 alliance key points there's a whole range of incentives a multitude of things you can do it really is the limit of your imagination what the incentives you can come up with um, but you have to think them through because all have pros and cons, all need to be matched to your circumstances to be effective. Uh, they will almost need some refining, they will always need some refining, whether it's an option Z clause in the scope or the partnering information or whatever. And the, my advice is uh, don't skimp on stages two and three. Yeah, drafting the contract is actually the easy bit, and the NEC gives it to you almost. It's the thinking behind it to make it work. Thank <music> you.